A very good evening to all of you. Uh, and it's my privilege to introduce uh, speakers on the dais. Uh, one is my teacher, uh, Professor K. Jagannath, who is an icon uh, in the field of uh, tuberculosis. Almost every uh, pulmonologist in Tamil Nadu, why in, Pal in Tamil Nadu, in all over South India, would have been his student. He was a director of the uh, Institute of Thoracic Medicine for nearly 20 years. And uh, I am very proud to say that I was uh, also a student of him, both as an undergraduate and uh, for my post um, and postgraduate. Another, another is uh, Dr. Prasanna Kumar Thomas. You were classmates. You were uh, more than 43 years have been together. Uh, he was the best outgoing student of uh, uh, both DTCD and uh, MD chess and got a... Uh, Three, three medal, medals from uh, Madras Medical College and he is uh, a senior consultant respiratory physician in Apollo Hospital, Vijaya and Balaji Hospital in Chennai and he is also a visiting professor of Sri Ramachandra University. Um, both of them, I think they don't uh, need any introduction to this audience. We will go on straight to the session. Thank you, Dr. Raj Goparan, for those very kind words. It's indeed a great pleasure to be here this evening to share a few thoughts with you. I thank Kadila for having given me the opportunity to be here. I have a very unique position today to speak in front of two people. One is my teacher and the other is my boss. So, while there is a tinge of um, um, satisfaction and, uh, and happiness, there is also the feeling that uh, I'm very happy because I think whatever questions you ask will be answered by them. It shouldn't be a problem to me at all. So we've been looking at uh, very heart-rending diseases and I think um, Dr. Suresh Kumar made a very graphic description. So you have your first patient lined up for tomorrow. I will be there. Um, so I think after, look, after looking at all these um, um, rather not so very exciting things. I think we'll talk about something which is very mundane and daily life oriented. Let's talk about tuberculosis and the way that we're going to take tuberculosis forward. I'm afraid this is going to be a little futuristic in the sense that all of us know that TB is a problem today as we see that. But we will look at this disease and find out to what extent, I don't know where I need to push this. Excuse me, can you? Oh, this is the up and down. Yes, I think I got it. Right? That's it. Fine. Uh, we look at treatment, we look at diagnostics, and we look at prevention. A lot of been said about um, TB vaccines. We're still not so sure we stand on that. But there are rapid diagnostic tests for TB today, and especially MDR TB, which I think is very, very important as I see that. If you look at these things that you look at here today, the diagnostics are going to be the key things that we're looking at. We're looking at drug-resistant TB. New drugs and regimens don't seem to be existing at this point of time. There are some things in the horizon we'll talk about, but then it doesn't seem to be very exciting to me. So we look at the road to TB elimination. We will start transmission, neutralize latent infection. The vaccine, we've already talked about that. Treatment of active TB, more effective drugs, rapid drug sensitivity testing shorter, simpler regimens. And I think that's extremely important to look at because I think one of the biggest problems that we have with TB today is the fact that we're looking at a very long duration of treatment. Patients fall off by the, way, by, by the wayside and we're not able to ensure compliance. So we look at two basic drugs which have been introduced. We have Delamid and, uh, and uh, Vedaquilin. We look at that a little later on. So Vedaquilin will be the first anti-TB drugs developed in over 40 years. There's lack of interest in the industry as such as far as anti-TB drugs is concerned. Now you look at rifampicin, it's, it's probably 30, 40 years old and nothing has come beyond that. And even today, I think if you look at effectivity, there's nothing to beat rifampicin, nothing to get even close to rifampicin. And I think there's been a whole lack of interest and people have now started waking up to the fact the TB is coming back with a vengeance. It's coming back as a tsunami to us. And I think we need to understand that we need to have these medications out. And I think all of us jolly well wake up very quickly. Approved by the US FDA in December 2012 for MDR. And presentation, of course, marketed under the name of Ceruto. 
Barakul decreases energy production by M2 closes by inhibiting ATP synthase, inhibits growth of um, rapidly replicating as well as non replicating. Drug sensitive and drug resistant bacilli. I think this is the this is the um, real action of Barakulin that I think could be important. There is no pro cross resistance. We will look at precautions to be used only as an effective treatment when others cannot be provided. And I think that's perhaps the most important underlining equation that we see here today. It of course can cause QT interval prolongation. We need to monitor liver enzymes. So 200 milligram three times a week for about 22 weeks. Again, you look at um, uh, the duration as such the treatment is going to be extremely difficult. We look at Delamid, it's a nitroimidazole derivative, it inhibits mycolic acid synthesis approved by the European Union, undergoing phase 3 trials. Again, you find very clearly that these are not drugs that are going to come tomorrow. I think that's something that we very clearly need to understand, that we need to make do with what we have today. And I think that's the crux of the whole situation. So we look at the other drugs, we have um, Sutizolid, we have SQ109 and then of course we have a couple of names, PAA24 which is Protamand, we have new drugs on the horizon which we will be looking at a little later on. This of course is a linozolid analog currently undergoing phase 2 clinical trials, it acts by inhibiting bacteria protein synthesis. I think the question in all these drugs is trying to reduce your treatment duration, I think the crux is that. What is the drug which is going to bring down the duration of my treatment, which is now at six months as we see it today? Can we make this four months? Can we make this three months, two months? All these drugs, I think, are basically directed towards that. So, um, sutizolid versus linozolid, probably better antimicrobial activity, improved safety compared to linozolid, but I think only time will tell whether this is going to be true. It's called early bacterial activity, addition to standard anti-TB regimen, it does improve efficacy if you add it to a standard anti-TB regimen. It has the potential, at least at this point of time, to try and shorten the duration of treatment. We talked about shortening, which I think is so very important today, and whatever we have achieved with TB today is because we have shortened the TB treatment to, from one to about six months as we see it today, probably one of the main reasons why we have had the success that we have had in treating patients with tuberculosis. It does not um, interact with um, CYP450 enzyme, not likely to interact with most antiretrovirals, good option for HIV patients. I think that's another very huge chunk that we are looking at. What are the chunk of HIV patients who are going to benefit with the newer type of antituberculous drugs? What is going to be the pattern of drug resistance that we have in patients with HIV and TB? And I think that's something that we need to look at again. This is a huge, huge sort of volume at the horizon that we need to look at. So we have SQ109, which is an ethylene diamine derivative. It's an analog of ethimbutol, currently undergoing phase 3 trials for MDR-TB, active against drug susceptible as well as multidrug resistant TB. It's got an early bactericidal action. It's got a synergistic action with rifampicin. It's got a low bacterial mutation rate. And we understand today that bacterial mutation is one of the main mechanisms by which these drugs develop resistance over a period of time. So we have a PA824, which is a protamin, it's a bicyclic uh, nitroimidazole derivative. It's active against drug susceptible as well as multidrug resistant TB, useful option in patients with TBHIV. As I said, this is again a drug which is probably poised in that direction, and probably over the next couple of years we will be seeing this combination in patients who, are, who have this very common combination of TB and HIV. So the dual mechanism of action, synergism with moxifloxacin and pyrazinamide, and potential, as I said, to shorten the treatment. So this goal, I think, is something which will be seen right through the fact that you want to shorten the duration of treatments. We see that. Now we look at this drug, and I think it's um, interesting in the fact that we're looking at reinforcing the side effects, of, um, I mean, reducing the side effects of this drug and reinforcing the potential of this drug. We all understand today that rifampicin is the cornerstone of anti-TB treatment. There's no question that this is the foundation of anti tuberculosis treatment. There can be no anti tuberculosis treatment which is complete today, at least to begin with, um, unless you have rifampicin resistance without rifampicin. So rif rifampicin is, an, is, a, is, is, is a pillar that you really look at in anti tuberculosis treatment. And any innovation in around rifampicin, around rifampicin 
I think will be something which will be quite interesting. So the major limitations of rifampicin are poor GI and hepatic tolerance. I think all of us have seen that, especially Indian patients who are low weight patients who are 30 kilos and, and under will have a lot of problems tolerating rifampicin at the dose it, it, it's really available in. So oral tolerance to rifampicin, gastrointestinal tolerance has always been a probability. Low and variable bioavailability. I think that's another very important thing that you're really looking at. The bioavailability of medication, subtherapeutic serum rifampicin levels and multiple adverse drug interactions we have seen right from flu syndrome to skin allergy and downwards we really find that it's a problem. And the other normal thing that we have as a problem with, with using antituberculous drugs is the fact that they need to be given together. And I think that's something that all of us need to adhere Thing as practitioners of this art of medicine, I think we need to understand that antituberculous drugs need to be given in a bunch and given together and not split apart during the day to be given separately as the other drugs are taken. So we, we need to understand that the, this rifampicin has certain clear shortcomings without question. So what, what sort of difference is this really going to make? It's going to be, be variable the fact that you're going to add a drug called Piper into that and try and reduce the dose of rifampicin and retain the efficacy of rifampicin, I think is the key. You reduce the dose of rifampicin, you reduce the side effects, but you retain the potential of rifampicin as far as the drug is concerned, I think that's important. Clinical efficacy at par with rifampicin, GI tolerance is improved, the risk of hepatitis reduced, your treatment adherence is low, adherence is high. The benefits of course are improved adherence to treatment, lower treatment failures, reduced RAP rates, Minimized, um, so preferred treatment of drug susceptible and pulmonary extra pulmonary tuberculosis, ideal switch over therapy for patients who develop intolerable GI side effects with hepatotoxicity with a higher dose of rifampicin, useful in alcoholics, patients with fatty liver disease and the rest, and I think it does become important. So as I said, we search for, for lower duration in antituberculous regimens. We started with about 24 months, and we are now at four months and our vision is 10 days, which I think uh, I can only use one word for 10 days and that's being very avaricious. I can't find another word for that. I don't honestly think that in our lifetime we're going to see uh, tuberculosis being treated for 10 days. I think that will be um, very, very difficult to digest. So new antibody regimen, shorten the duration of treatment, add drugs to standard regimen. Moxicin has been talked about to a great deal as far as shortening the duration of treatment, there are a lot of trials containing regimens to shorten the duration of oxyfoxacin. The REMOX trial, for example, is an important study duration. You find definitely that the moxifloxacin does shorten the duration. But as I said, the use of moxifloxacin as a regular therapy as such in patients who are being um, uh, naive as such, who in naive patients I think is a question that you really need to consider. Whether you can use moxifloxacin in a sort of um, um, a tumultuous basis to begin with as far as antituberculous treatment is concerned, I would think that we need to reserve these drugs for the sort of resistant arm that we're really looking at. But if you really want to shorten the duration, I think this is one option that you may need to consider it at some point in time, though it does not appear to be very practical at this point of time. There are a lot of ongoing trials with moxifloxacin. There are multiple combinations to treat MDR. We have bedequilin, moxifloxacin, pyrazinamide, and PA824. We have multiple regimens, clofazimin, bedequilin, and other drugs. In all these, I think the principle is to cut down the duration of treatment and increase compliance. Really look at the stand is a shortening treatment by advancing normal drugs. The first trial to combine a common regimen in drug sensitive as well as drug resistant and uh, tuberculosis. It's by the TBL, I think. This is, of course, PA824 plus moxifloxacin plus pyrazinamide. The objective, of course, six months investigational regime of uh, levo plus linezolid with pyrazinamide, um, ethionamide high dose, along with INH and plus bedequil. And I think you're giving a host of a cocktail of medications, and I think we need to look at this with, um, um, with a great deal of skepticism. First clinical trial for a new XDR TB regimen. And includes bedequilin PA824 and linezolid potential to short the duration um, to under six months. And I think that again is the bottom running line that we are getting out here. Reduce side effects, reduce 
duration of treatment. I think that's the key that we're really looking at. Diagnostics, I think, is something that is really very, very important to us as we look at antigen detection, microscopic visualization by the LED microscope, culture-based detection, and then you have the replication of m closes by nucleic acid amplification. Then, of course, you have volatile organic compounds that are being replicated, immune responses, um, the um, INF um, um, quantiferon, the immune response, the, the antibody detection tests and the serologic tests. We have gone a lot of a distance today with the BACTEC and the MGITs and the line probe assays. And I think those are the things that we really need to sort of structure for a period of time. Gene Expert is a wonderful test to begin with where you can get rifampicin resistance very quickly and then you can sort of start moving on that so that the most potent anti tuberculosis drugs are still kept in, in waiting of liquid cultures. We have um, um, automated detection for MDR screening, we have molecular line probe assays, we have sp strip specification which detects a specific TB antigen from solid presence of M, M tuberculosis. There are a host of these um, um, antigenic um, um, uh, cultures that are available and I think these are things that are going to be very important over a period of time and need to understand. The gene expert we've already talked about, it will detect rifampicin resistance in less than 24 hours you will get a rifampicin resistant sequence but we don't unnecessarily need to expose this patient to rifampicin in a situation where you think or you suspect that you have a rifampicin resistance. So the gene expert say specificity is about 97 percent, the sensitivity is about 90 percent. I understand today that, um, that the gene expert, the MDR TB plus the gene expert TB, I think these are important things that the MDR benefits Plus benefits can be performed from patient to patient. Simultaneous detection of the MTB complex, I think that again becomes important with the presence of NTM and the rest of those things. It does become important that you are identifying the MTB complex, resistant and or INH, rapid results, you get it in about 5 hours, allows early appropriate treatment. Interferon Gamma selected two commercial tests, the Quantiferon TB Gold and the TB Spot test. And we understand today it does not differentiate active TB disease from latent infection. And I think the lesser we do these tests, the better. But I think a question of um, information about these is important to try and uh, to try and understand the validity of this test is important. To understand that these tests do not validate active disease from latent disease, and you cannot use them as a single diagnostic index in patients with tuberculosis. I think that again is something that we need to assess again and again. Serologic tests, um, tumoral immune response, currently 1.5 million tests mainly by ELISA, not recommended by any international guideline and not used in developed countries at all. So I think we need to be very, very skeptical about these serologic tests which do only one thing, which is bore a hole in the pocket of the patient. And I think we need to differ from doing these tests because these are not going to be uh, of any significance at all. So we understand that um, do more harm than do good as far as the serologic tests are concerned, use discouraged by WHO and RNTCP. We have TB diagnostic tests under development, revaluation, breath analyzer, screening test. What a fantastic investigation that will be. If you can breathe into an analyzer and it tells you you have TB, if you breathe into an analyzer and tells you that you have resistance to all these drugs, I think that will be the day really. That will be the sort of a Star Wars day in TB maybe. We don't know really at this point of time. We have of course the line, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, detection in urine that we have in LAM. And of course you have in prevention of TB. The TB vaccine has been always talked about. But I think it's in some, it's in some shape at this point of time. Now, there is some, um, some vague idea, the fact that the TB vaccine is around the corner somewhere. And if and when it does arrive, I think it will be a great specimen for us. So TB is a very complex disease at this point of time. While there is a simple TB which is about say maybe 40 to 60 percent, at least today we are finding the more difficult and difficult TB patient that we are treating today. Even five, six years ago, write a prescription for six months and give it to the patient. Today I do that. I, I write it only for 30 days, ask him to come back because I am not sure. In spite of the fact that I picked up the sweat and positivity, I'm still not sure. I think that is the question. 
there are so many patients who don't respond at all and then you, you, you rather think backwards that maybe I should have sent a culture up front and I think that's really what we should be doing any TB positivity that you see I think a good gene expert in, in that patient and the sense that you do a back tech at least to begin with so you can follow that up with an LP or something like that I think would be so I think the whole structure of TB is changing and I think and if you can reinforce rifampicin for example with a sort of lesser toxicity and better action I think it will be very good I'm sorry I've gone backwards I'm sorry so TB vaccine is under development despite all TB still remains a major challenge rapid diagnosis of TB is possible DNA expert MDR TB plus TBSL newer drugs have the potential to reduce duration but a risk offers an equal opportunity but a better tolerated option to conventional Pampson. But we need to understand, and I think we'll close with the words of the great Sir William Osler. The study of disease, you leave the exact and certain, the inexact and doubtful, and enter into a realm in which to a great extent the certainties are replaced by probabilities. Certainties, ladies and gentlemen, are replaced by probabilities. Thank you for patient listening. Yeah. So I would uh, keep you waiting for a long time. The main thrust which I wanted to say was as far as drug sensitive patients are concerned, the best possible thing that we can do is to give them the most effective treatment and for this I think compliance does play a very important role and another thing which is compliance is that the patient should have probably very minimal side effects in order that he should take these medicines for a long time. In this direction, we have gone on to a new, direct, a new drug which is uh, part of rifampicin and that is the low dose of rifampicin which is uh, Rizrin. The problem with rifampicin as all, probably all of you who have been using rifampicin is firstly the personal side effect. I don't think any patient who for the first 15 days of treatment with rifampicin has not had any problem as far as the gastrointestinal side effects are concerned and possibly this deters the patient from continuing the medicines for a long time. So Rizorin which has 200 milligrams of rifampicin seems to be a good alternative in more ways than one. The problem of rifampicin on the side effects 450 milligrams that destruction of rifampicin and hence the bioavailability is severely hampered and we are not going to take regularly the bioavailability or probably the serum levels of a patient who has been taking rifampicin 450 milligrams over a period of time. A lot of these experiments just have gone in to just find out the bioavailability of rifampicin at the time of start treatment not has been said about what is the bioavailability of patients who have either failed to treat with the first line drugs or maybe at the end of treatment with the first line drugs. So I think it is in this particular direction that a lot of uh, involvement was made by Carilla and we found that the addition, a small addition of 10 milligrams of piperine has made an effective drug is Rizorin by reducing the effective dose of rifampicin from 450 to 200. Absolutely very minimal side effects and there is no auto destruction of rifampicin and hence we have a very high or probably the best possible bioavailability of rifampicin in the serum of patients who have been taking the medicine not only at the beginning but even at the completion of the treatment. So I would think that possibly this could make a big difference to patients and hence the outcome for patients have been given for drugs in drug sensitive patients.